Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Roth, and I'm the moderator for today's GBXML webinar. Let's uh, wait another minute or two for more people to show up, and then we will get started. So I will be back in about a minute or two. Thank you. All right, everyone, let's get started. All right, my name is Stephen Roth. I'm with Carmel Software, and I'm also on the board of GBXML. And today's webinar will encompass a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I will give an overview of GBXML, especially for those of you maybe relatively new to the industry. It's always good to talk about exactly what we are all about. And then Ian Malloy of Autodesk will demo the new Revit Systems Analysis Workflow, which involves GBXML. Then following Ian's presentation, Krishnan Gowri of Intertech will talk about the latest ASHRAE research project that is focused on improving the way software integrates with GBXML. Then if there's time at the end, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. However, in the meantime, you can use the little questions applet in the GoToWebinar applet to ask your questions, and we will do our best to answer them during the webinar. Uh, do not use the chat, use the question applet, please. So before we continue, I'd like to do a quick poll. And the first one is, what kind of uh, professional are you? And then after you answer that, I will show you the results. Okay, I will close the poll, and then I will share the results with you. And it looks like most of you are energy modelers, second place are engineers, then software designers, architects, and others. So great, just what I expected. All right, and I'll do another poll uh, in a couple minutes. So as I mentioned, I want to give an overview of GBXML. And let me hide that poll, there we go. So I want to give an overview of GBXML, especially for those of you who are new to the industry. I want to make sure that you really understand what we are 
all about. So I like to say GBXML is the language of buildings. It allows disparate building design software tools to all communicate with one another. Now, BIM, Building Information Modeling, and GBXML are complementary with one another. The whole essence of BIM is interoperability, getting the data out of the BIM and into other tools that can utilize this data. Now, think of GBXML as the transport mechanism that allows that data to flow from the BIM to external tools and back. So GBXML is not a programming language and it is not a software tool. It is a language, an XML schema that focuses solely on storing data about buildings. So what type of data does GBXML store? Well, GBXML has over 500 elements, attributes, and enumerations that describe all aspects of a building for purposes of analysis. And what you can see on your screen here is just a subset of some of those elements in the building GBXML schema, including planar geometry, a rectangular polygon, polygon geometry, constructions, materials, thermal and emission properties, and so on. So the real power behind GBXML are its geometric elements, basically allowing tools to draw a schematic or analytical view of the building for purposes of importing into analysis tools and also for viewing it on web-based and desktop tools. So what types of analysis does GBXML support? Well, here's a, a partial list of the types of analysis, whole building energy analysis, water use, carbon emissions, heating and cooling loads, HVAC equipment sizing, lighting analysis, computational fluid dynamic analysis, fire analysis, and more. So it really can accommodate all types of building analysis. So why GBXML? I mean, what, what are the benefits of it? Well, it facilitates the transfer of that building information from the BIM into your analysis tool. So you don't have to re-enter it all over again. And it's all in the name of helping architects, engineers, and energy modelers to design more energy efficient buildings. So it's really a time saver. So a little bit about the logistics of GBXML. It's an open source schema. It's free. It's available on gbxml.org and also on GitHub. Just do a, a search for Green Building XML. We have a board of directors comprised of 11 BIM authoring and building analysis software vendors and we're maintained by an industry consortium. Uh, we have over 50 software applications that support GBXML as of today. It's currently funded by Autodesk and other partners, and the latest version is 6.1. And amazingly, this year is the 20th anniversary of GBXML. It was founded back in 1999 by Green Building Studio. And it's growing stronger than ever with increased adoption, two concurrent research projects, one of which will be discussed today, and much more. So one thing I do want to make you aware of is we do have a free online GBXML viewer that you can access from the gbxml.org website. And all you need to do is go to gbxml.org and in the upper right-hand corner, click viewer. And this viewer allows you to upload GBXML files, view them in your browser, pan, zoom, explode views, and even edit the file. And you can also view it not only on your desktop, but on your smartphone and tablet. Now, another interesting thing about GBXML is you may have heard of a schema called Building Sync from NREL. It is focused on commercial building energy audit data and is used by municipal utility programs in New York City and San Francisco. Now, the next version of Building Sync schema will actually be referencing the geometric elements of the GBXML schema. So now we're starting to be referenced by other schemas. Also, all the time, new software tools are integrating with GBXML. The latest tool I just heard about is one that's being developed in-house by Perkins and Will called SPEED, which stands for Simulation Platform for Energy Efficient Design. And it is a web-based and cloud-based energy daylighting solar design and simulation platform for early design that was developed for architects. And then a new workflow involving GBXML involves the latest version of Revit, which Ian will talk about. So before we continue with that, though, I do want to do one more poll. And this one is, what type of BIM or design software do you currently use?
Okay, I will close the poll and share the results. And as you can see, most of you are licensed DIM software users. Some of you uh, license building analysis tools. Others use open source tools. So a good mix. All right. So let's get started with our demos. So I would like to present Ian Malloy of Autodesk, and he will be doing demoing the Revit Systems Analysis tool, which utilizes GBXML to communicate with Open Studio. So I will hand it over to Ian. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let me just share my screen here. There we go. Can you see the uh, white screen there? Just a PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. So first of all, thanks for having me, Stephen, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I'm actually going to go through a, a presentation that I actually did for an Autodesk webinar yesterday. This is just for times as a shorter version of that. It's more focused, uh, less on the background, because I think everybody here knows a lot about this. Um, to describe it as a demo is a stretch just for time. I can't actually do much live demo. So I've got a lot of videos um, uh, to walk you through everything. Uh, if you want to know more, please feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Um, but basically, this is a, an entirely new feature in Revit. I think many of you know Revit is on a, sort of an, uh, has been a long time on an annual release cycle. Everybody looks to the big uh, numbers for the releases, but in recent years we've been doing point releases that have new features in them, and this new one is actually arguably one of the biggest features we've added in a in a point release. Um, and so we're we're really excited about it. We've been working on it on it for a long time from a number of angles, and GBXML is a critical uh, component uh, to this whole workflow. Um, so yeah, so let me let me just get started. Um, so in terms of like what Revit systems analysis is, you know, from a Revit context, when you think about Revit, uh, it is uh, you know whether it be architecture or MEP modeling, it's essentially a 3D modeling tool, and the main use case for it is 3D coordination. I you know does the stuff actually fit in the building, um, and then the other aspect is production of documents, and then uh, more recently we've invested in the ability to use it for detailing, uh, for um, estimation, and for fabrication. Um, but it's mostly all about 3D modeling, 3D geometry, and so on. And uh, what systems analysis is, I describe it as the sort of the middle piece between those two, between the architecture and the MEP. You know, I know everybody here sort of inherently understands that, but you know, from a from a BIM perspective, broader audience, it's not necessarily as clear. And so, you know, we have this ability to create uh, an analytical model. That's just our term for the GBXML, uh, as well as do the analysis. That's essentially what we're, we're uh, using um, GBXML, Open Studio, and Energy Plus to do. But that's obviously providing all of your um, HVAC size selection and sizing calculations, doing annual energy and comfort analysis. But critically, from a BIM perspective, it's not just about extracting the, the architectural geometry into an analytical model. It's also the connective tissue between the analytical model, the analytical systems, and the actual physical model as well. It's the way I kind of describe it is the only reason a duct or a pipe exists or needs to be modeled is that somebody picked a system type and you know, selected some equipment that needs to be connected. And so it provides context for that whole uh, physical model. Now, you can do that with Revit today, but it's up to you to embody the system with all of that detail. And of course, it means you have to model the system to, to represent that, which, you know, from an analysis perspective, you would never model that system on the right-hand side just to do an analysis of it. You don't need to do that. Um, so, so that's sort of it at a very high level in terms of what it, uh, what it does. In terms of how it works, it's essentially a series of uh, workflows that connect, you know, inputs to outputs. Everyone here will be familiar with the, the, the big five things around location of climate, building geometry, materials, uh, building space type function on the HVAC systems. That's kind of like a mirror version of the GBXML schema on the left hand side there. Um, and I think everybody knows that building geometry in the HVAC systems are the areas that are the most kind of cumbersome and challenging. Traditionally, everything else is relatively straightforward. And on the output side, you've got the sort of classic kind of sizing and selection workflows as well as energy. Um, uh, we've, we've essentially built two basic sort of primary workflows, but on top of that, you can, you can customize it and build a lot of other further things. But the critical thing to highlight here is that it's sort of we provide these workflows in a very scalable way, where just as an architectural model can go from conceptual through to schematic and detailed, uh, uh, every other aspect of that model, uh, you know, the, not just the mechanical systems, but also material thermal properties and space function can go from conceptual, schematic, and detailed. I'll get that in into that a little bit more detail. 
And what it means is it sets up a very flexible way to actually work where there isn't just a single linear path or right or wrong path through this. You could, for example, start with a uh, conceptual architectural model, but do more detailed systems analysis on top of that. Or you could start with a very detailed architectural model, but do a fairly simple systems analysis on top of that. It all depends on what your, your starting point is and what your goal is. Um, the other aspect of this as well is the ability to, to sort of provide a feedback loop between the analytical model and the physical model as well. So that's something I'll get into. Um, now, everyone here knows, again, that, you know, the typical application of analysis is around the sort of DDCD stages. And we're always trying to, uh, you know, front load things. ASHRAE uh, standard two, 209 provides a good sort of, you know, outline for how to, how to do this. And we, we feel that what we've got here really helps bridge that sort of early piece into the sort of traditional piece. Um, and so in terms of what we've actually done here, I mean, in its simplest, we've done an integration between Revit and Energy Plus. Uh, we've done these kinds of things in the past. You know, we've used Energy Plus in different ways, we've different features. I'll touch on some of that, you know, where it sits relative to that. But what's critical about this is how we've done this. Um, and what we've done here is uh, we've used our all for GBXML as the transport mechanism, but the, the, the real sort of game changer for us was the use of the Open Studio SDK and APIs to do the translation between GBXML and Energy Plus. So that while we have built some kind of typical sizing and energy workflows, uh, they basically work off a series of scripts. So when you press the analyze button, it creates GBXML in the background, it runs these Open Studio scripts, creates the IDF, and then runs the analysis. So what it means is it's totally open for customization uh, not just customization but open and transparent in terms of you can see what's actually happening it minimizes the amount of sort of footprint that needs to be in Revit and the amount of data you have to have in Revit versus have it in the measures and uh, means it's uh, keeps it very uh, lean um, and then of course you can then customize it if you want to change the properties of any aspect of uh, uh, any object you can do that as well as do some more advanced um, uh, workflows around that I'll, which I'll get into a little later so, you know, this isn't our first rodeo. Autodesk, Autodesk has a long kind of history uh, in, in investing in this area. It goes way back to the very original heating and cooling load tool in Revit, which is um, like, I think, 14 years old at this stage. It was actually kind of the start of the whole effort around GBXML with Revit. That still exists today, but I will tell you, it's a very limited method from a geometric perspective. And also, it's just a very limited radiant time series method. Uh, people who use it, it's, if you're using it, that's great. You know what its limitations are and you know what its purposes are. Uh, then more re recently with Autodesk Insight and the Insight Rev plugin, we used Energy Plus to do the heating and cooling load calculations. And, you know, that's obviously, it was better because we were using more advanced geometry and we were using Energy Plus. But the key limitation with both of these was that it was just space heating and cooling loads. In other words, there was no equipment or plant in the equation. That's really the, the key thing. So these things still exist. Um, they're not going away, but this new systems analysis feature essentially completely, you know, overrides the need, need for these things if, if uh, you, you um, once you learn how to use it. People might also be interested in just the relationship with, uh, with this new feature and uh, Insight. Now, Insight is our kind of early stage uh, uh, energy analysis tool, you know, provides overall direction and the whole building energy raid, uh, range. The idea is, you know, rapid early collaboration around key goals. Uh, the key thing about that is, is that it, um, it uses Dota 2 and runs in the cloud. Uh, it runs a few hundred simulations per model. Um, whereas what systems analysis is, it's running a sort of single energy plus run on the desktop, but it's it's much more detailed. So that's the way I kind of describe it. Insight is kind of like a telescope; it provides you with direction, whereas systems analysis provides you with position, a very high precision uh, uh, on uh, and control over virtually every input uh, that you want. So we really see these as sort of two sides of the same coin. You kind of need you kind of need both, right? So what I'm going to do now is walk you through bit by bit sort of the workflow, also the data model, and then give you this sort of demo, so to speak. Um, so the first piece of allocation is, is really simple. It's a sort of set it once and you're done. It's very simple in Revit, just set the location. From that, we can get the climate data from two sources. You know, Traditionally, we've had a large database of TMYs and AMYs that all over the world, uh, but we've used um, data from onebuilding.org to get uh, both the EPWs and the DDYs for Energy Plus. If you have your own custom weather files, you can also just change the line in the code in the Open Studio script to use that if that's what you want to do. Uh, it's very easy to do that. Um, 
building geometry, right? So this is one of the big areas that people get bogged down on, and, and I continue to find, you know, it's the most misunderstood area from the Revit perspective and from GBXML and things like that. But the key thing you got to sort of ask yourself is, you know, what's your starting point and what's your goal? Um, and so from the architectural perspective, you could be, you know, you might just have a, a napkin sketch or you could have some PDFs or DWGs and those, you don't even have a Revit model. If you do have a Revit model, then of course it, it can vary in levels of detail from something as simple as a, you know, box model of the building with some levels through to having, you know, curtain walls and the building shell modeled through to a very, very detailed uh, model. Um, and, you know, the, the normal go-to place that people think about um, is like this high level of detail and precision that they want to get to. Um, and that's entirely possible. You can do that. This is the, essentially the same features that architects have been using uh, to run inside. They're able to translate essentially, essentially any arbitrary collection of Revit elements into a, a highly accurate uh, set of analytical spaces and surfaces. But the thing I always want to point out to people is that that shouldn't really be your starting point because it's even though it is still fast to do that, it's still cumbersome to do, and it's not always the best thing to do. So, so the most sort of valuable or recommended thing is really to you know work from those early stages. You know, we all know that. But from Revit's perspective, it's very easy. Just you know, uh, model a mass, window wall ratio, perimeter core zoning, and you'll get uh, you know a nice model from that. The schematic stage kind of is like everything in between. But the bit that I really wanted to highlight here was the fact that there's a couple of ways of working here. Uh, with Revit, uh, which is, um, uh, for, first of all, you know, again, depending on your starting point, uh, a, a really common feature in Revit that a lot of people don't know about is just the ability to uh, link and copy monitor uh, architectural models. So and that way you can take pieces of the architectural model. Um, and at the same time, we also have various objects that you can use to enhance the level of detail that you want to get into in the model. You'll all be familiar with spaces uh, in Revit. Now, there's a bit of confusion about that because in the past, we used to always generate the geometry from the spaces. That's still possible, um, but this, this new method essentially only uses spaces for their data, basically their occupancy lighting and equipment and so on. The new thing that we've added is what we call system zones, and that's basically the ability to define what regions of the building are served by what equipment. But for the moment, I'm just going to focus on purely the geometry, you know, turning a bunch of architectural walls, floors, roofs, or massing into a set of you know, what we would call zones. So this first a um, uh, uh, little video here uh, will uh, show you this sort of day one workflow that you can do. But what I'm doing is I'm starting a blank Revit project with a, with a template. Um, I'm importing an architectural uh, model. I'm basically linking it in. I'm going to use a feature called Copy Monitor to basically copy in the, the, the levels. And so that copies and monitors them. So it means that if the architecture sent, sends me a new, new model or if I'm on BIM 360, it'll get automatically updated. This isn't just limited to levels, it works with grids and walls and floors and windows and things like that. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just bringing in the levels and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use this as a reference to very quickly model the building shell using massing. This is very similar to kind of the way a lot of, you know, traditional energy modeling tools work, it's just a shell model. But instead of modeling spaces, you're modeling the whole building and you can then divide it up by, by level. Then all we need to do is apply um, uh, perimeter core zoning, a, a bit of window to wall ratio. When we create the analytical model, you'll see you've got a nice perimeter core zoning um, and all the analytical surfaces are categorized as you would expect them to be. You're basically looking at GBXML and Revit um, uh, and you've got the abilities in Revit to, to, to create different views and sections and cuts to kind of validate that that model is as you would see fit. So again, a very, very effective uh, conceptual early uh, analytical model uh, for you to use. Now, one little step up from, from uh, that is basically to just start to import more of that model, right? So in this case here, I'm literally just gonna copy the exterior shell of the building, like the walls that also contain the windows. Now again, you all know it's one thing to model all the spaces, it's another to model the windows. It's just a very quick way to extract what you want from the architectural model uh, and use it to inform your, your, your analytical, because the analytical, if I haven't mentioned, is, is generated completely automatically. There's no analytical authoring, you're just doing a sort of a translation between the two. And it, and it speeds things up. Now, very often the architecture model doesn't contain what you want it to contain. And this is a great example. This is typically the stage most system sizing modeling kind of things get to where, you know, you, you want to capture the building, uh, the HVAC zoning. So although in an architecture model, you see all the internal walls and that, that, that define the room layout from a HVAC zoning perspective, you may want to just ignore them. Now in the link, they're not, they're only visible. They're not actually active. So what I've done is I've just drawn a couple of walls within this model. And notice I'm building on that conceptual mass model to essentially give me the zoning that I want, right? So this is just allowing me to say, yeah, I want a north, south, east, west zone. 
and you know that's essentially the basis of things so essentially in that regard it's just like any other uh, um, uh, uh, you know analytical modeling that you would do in a third-party tool but it's all entirely within Revit uh, a key thing people ask me a lot of the time is is it tolerant to kind of gaps and overlaps because Revit models contain a lot of complexity and the answer is yes I mean we built this new algorithm to do this to really tolerate that and it's, it's very very uh, robust up to the point where you can actually process an entire model and you need to be a little bit careful with this that's why i say always learn to walk before you run but basically what this shows now is you know fully detailed architecture model you'll see inside it it's all the rich curtain walls and ceilings and columns and stuff like that um, and here what we're actually doing is we're translating uh, the only thing we're adding to the model is spaces right and in this case here the only reason i'm adding them is because i want to specify what they relate to right now if i don't add spaces to the model which I don't need to to do everything you've seen so far. That's fine. We'll create analytical spaces, and every space will will follow the building type profile, right? And um, but what I've done is I've gone into each corner of the building here and set each space to be something different, like an active storage or a bank customer. I just picked a couple of different system types or building uh, space types, so that when you create the analytical model, uh, you'll see those spaces are inheriting that data from those space objects. So spaces are just really carriers of data. And if they're present in your model, they'll just enhance the level of detail for that region of the building. But you don't have to have them from a geometric geometry perspective. So you see the way each space now has picked up the appropriate space type. So basically, uh, and then you'll see the surfaces here as well, right? It's fairly straightforward. You know, uh, it shows all the correct categories, and you know, it, it interprets that pretty intelligently. You know, what's what's interior, exterior, shade, and things like that. It's very very robust. Uh, it's a little different to what you're sort of maybe normally used to because when you manually create a model you generally create it as neatly as and efficiently as you can you know we don't we, we don't need to do that because we're automatically doing this this translation so you will see in some cases there's a bit more complexity in the model than you need surfaces might be more broken up but because that's not really getting in the way of you're not assigning data to the analytical model you're actually assigning it to the physical objects and then creating this analytical model that gets processed uh, it, 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 it works fine um, so this is one little thing I didn't show yesterday, but this is just that that model viewed as GBXML uh, in the online viewer, um, and so it's uh, pretty effective. You will see around that, just around the back of the building, little slivers, a little gap there. That's not going to cause air leakage or solar gain or anything like that. That's just a small underestimation of the surface area, which is, you know, really noise in the scheme of things. They can be bigger, and there's ways to get, you know, if you just use this feature out of the box, you'll often get very large gaps but there's workflows if you follow the help to, to really minimize them bottom line is the geometry is within a few percent of the actual areas and volumes and i think again everybody knows here that manual modeling is not a terribly accurate process at, at best it's maybe plus or minus 10 percent um, and so again these are all capabilities that uh, insight has been using for a lot of time to generate that analytical model but we've added in some enhancements to it to make it more applicable for uh, the more precise control you need for it for doing low calcs or annual energy simulation. Uh, how am I doing for time, Stephen? I just realize I'm sort of really, really going here. I'm going to oh, you, just... Yeah, you have, you have about five to seven more minutes. So keep okay. going if you have more to show. Okay. So then the other piece is the material thermal properties. I'll do this quickly. There's really three ways to do it. It's like the geometry, conceptual schematic detail. You know, you don't have to have building elements in the model in order to find the properties. There are these kind of default conceptual types that are just very broad ranges of... Uh, high and low insulation and thermal mass and things like that. There's then these schematic types that are that are you know more detailed. There's like 60 to 80 of each. At this stage, they're they're very dated, right? Uh, you can hack that file. But what I would say to you from Revit's perspective, when we create Revit templates and content, we never expect people to use that in production. It's like you you would never see an architect create a Revit model from the content we create out of the box, right? It's like they create their own wall types and things like that. And the in, intent here is the same. The point is the data model is in place for you to do this. Now these early conceptual construction types work with any type of model, but the the sort of the, the the main one is that if you do have walls and floors and roofs and windows, you can actually add the usual information around things like thickness, layer, conductivity, density, specific capacity, as well as things like solar heat gain coefficient, uh, U value, and so on of glazing. Whatever's in the model and whatever your settings are set to, they essentially act as flags to determine what gets passed into the analytical model. So when you create that analytical model and you look at it in Revit, you'll be able to see what surfaces relate to what U values and what element types, so to speak. And it's it's really powerful because you can get down to that level of you know where every wall in theory could be different in the model, right? 
Um, building a space type function is kind of similar in that if you don't set anything else, you'll have a building type. Uh, building types can, you know, there's a standard list there. They roughly follow ASHRAE, um, but you can create your own and they fundamentally create, uh, contain the basic occupancy lighting and equipment and schedule information. Um, you can, however, optionally add spaces. And this is where people get confused because they think they have to add spaces to have control over the model. But in fact, if you think about it, with no spaces in the model and your whole building is an office, every space gets the same profile. But if you if you think about an office as 80% office type space, you only have to specify where they're different. But if you do want to get that high level of control or by an instance level, every room is a little different, you can do that. Um, so it's again, it scales with detail. And once again, whatever's in your model, whatever set gets passed to the, that should say analytical spaces. And you'll see each space has a space type with an occupancy, a lighting and equipment and so on. So um, next I'll touch on the, which the, this is the new part now, the mechanical systems. Uh, so if you don't add any, you'll get ideal air um, and that will behave much like the um, uh, inside heating and cooling load calculations. The new piece is this in analytical systems, which I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail, but it's basically the ability to define what equipment, what plants serve what regions of the building. Um, and it's sort of free like most, most kind of uh, use cases. The custom stuff is the fact that under the hood, because we're using Energy Post and Open Studio, uh, you can customize any of the parameters or properties of that equipment and have the behavior change depending on what you have. So it could be something as simple as just changing the chiller performance curve to actually linking it to a physical object in Revit or extracting data from Revit. And the example I like to give is, as we all know, energy models don't have account for the actual ductwork and pipework in the building. You don't know the actual pressure losses because you don't know the routing and the sizes. So we have the opportunity now to actually connect analytical to physical, uh, and that's going to be really exciting to see people do that. To be very clear, this feature does not do this out of the box because everybody's, you know, Revit model content is different on the right-hand side. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. You'll see this new feature in Revit called Analytical Systems in the system browser. And what it allows you to do is essentially create three object types and connect them, uh, uh, zone equipment, um, air systems, and, and, and hydronic loops. Um, so zone equipment are things like DAVs, fan coils, chill beams. Uh, and uh, each one of those uh, essentially has different options for it. So fan coils would have a hot water loop and a chill water loop. Uh, the VAV would have what air handler you need to serve. So basically what you need to do is just set out your kind of like the, the, the um, uh, overall object types that you have and the relationships between them. Um, and then once that's done, uh, you just use this very simple sketch outline tool. I mean, the idea is you're not remodeling the building. You're just, this is like a digitized form of what an engineer does in terms of redlining what regions of the building are served by what. You can use 2D regions or lines. Um, and essentially what you do is you attach the equipment uh, to those lines and you can put them on levels of the building. The net net of that, what you get when you look at the analytical model is it has this tree now showing you what equipment and what systems are serving what parts of the building, okay? So to look at it in GBXML terms, uh, you'll actually see here, this is where when you run that analysis under the hood, you'll see this is where now we're using uh, the uh, hydronic loop um, information and we've got the uh, zone HVAC equipment. We've added some new parameters here. It's not strictly currently exactly GBXML, but we have been talking to Stephen and the board about actually proposing this as an extension. It's, although we're using Energy Plus, we don't think it's, it's pretty agnostic, right? At the end of the day, these equipment and those sets of relationships are, are, are the same. So, you know, in theory, anyone should be able to use it. Uh, I'll just wrap up in terms of, you know, results. You'll see the kind of classic stuff, you know, from the sizing perspective. At the moment, we're, we're just dumping out the standard Energy Plus report, which has all the information on the boilers, the chillers, the fans, the pumps, and things like that. We're also producing, again, that classic energy modeling output stuff around uh, the um, uh, total building energy and so on. Uh, Insight doesn't do this. Insight provides the range, uh, but what this does is provides the actual breakdown that you're used to seeing. Sorry, this video isn't playing for me for some reason. Uh, yeah, so you know, you're all familiar with this kind of thing. There won't be, I won't spend too long on it. Um, the cool thing about this again is that this is also using an Open Studio measure so that you know you can uh, customize this. So uh, in terms of under the hood, you'll see these two workflows. They're actually stored as workflows locally. You can open them up. You can write your own. Uh, you can see what the parameters are. You can add them. You can share them, and you can run them. And um, so it really makes it a flexible uh, platform to work on. You can do anything from very simple things like control the weather data and simulation settings to get specific on the actual equipment, or do something more advanced. The whole point is this is open to anyone to customize. You, you guys all know, you know, uh, Open Studio and measures and how to write new ones and there's libraries of measures 
uh, that you can use. I will just finish on this. You know, this is all great new stuff. There are some there are some limitations in this. You know, we're always running into the uh, model complexity and size of things. That's why I always encourage people to start sort of you know at those simpler models and scale up to detail. You shouldn't be using a fully fully detailed model until later in the process. You know, they can take a couple of hours to run, um, but um, uh, uh, it's just something to be aware of. Uh, MDBus is still sensitive to geometry, so too much complexity it will fail. And the error messaging right now is non-existent. It'll just say it failed. Um, uh, but you know, as I said, if you, you, you'll learn yourself um, how it works. Overall, though, it is it is is very robust. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it there just for time, um, Stephen. I, I have a little bit more to talk about with benefits, but I think most people will kind of be aware of the benefits. We know some of the challenges with not doing this in a BIM platform versus doing a BIM platform. But the key thing I really want to want to point out here is this isn't just about enabling an analysis in another way. I think the key thing for us is that we're now enabling analysis, enable analysis in a way that can talk to the downstream modeling so that those two personas don't have to be in a different, uh, speak a different language. The key thing about this again is that, you know, what's making this possible is we're using under the hood GBXML, Energy Plus, Open Studio, all open source stuff. It's transparent. You can get in and hack it to your heart's content. But we'd love to see what you guys will uh, we think of this and we'll do with it. So I'll just stop there. All right, Ian, thanks so much. All right, before we continue, I wanna do one more poll and then we'll continue with Krishnan's presentation. All right, do you use GBXML regular, regularly for your BIM analysis workflow? Yes, no, or you don't even know? Okay. So the results are pretty much in line with uh, the previous webinar. 33% uh, say yes, 50% say no, and 7% are not sure. All right, so let's continue with the webinar. And next I would like to introduce Krishnan Gowry of Inter Intertech, and he We'll be talking about the latest ASHRAE research project, RP1810, and the title is actually quite a mouthful. It's titled Development of Reference Building Information Model, BIM, Test Cases for Improving Usage of Software Interoperability Schemas. And it's all in the name of helping improve GBXML, making the flow between BIM and analysis more seamless. So I am going to hand over the presentation to Krishnan. Thanks, Stephen. Um, let me share my screen. I'll make you presenter. Yeah, yeah I'll make you presenter. Okay. You see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Um, yes, I'll be talking about RP1810, and Stephen already provided you the full-length title. Um, basically, it is centered on uh, reference BIM test cases that can be used for validating, um, you know, GBXML exports that will help both the software developers um, to make sure that they are, um, you know, producing GBXML that is somewhat standardized and can be reliably used across all the tools. This is a project um, um, uh, by um, Bill Simhab, led by Rayleigh, and I'm a consultant to him, and Rayleigh is uh, unavailable today, so I'm filling in for him. The ideal workflow we all want from uh, GBXML is to take the BIM model and generate uh, an energy model from it without doing anything. But we know with the five test cases that are currently available from GBXML.org, we can essentially do that without having to touch the model. However, once when you go beyond the scope of these five test cases, we find that manual cleaning of the BIM model is required. As Ian went over the process, it is quite, um, you know, um, somewhat involved. Some software developers that are importing GBXML have 
specific requirements as to how the Revit, should, uh, Revit or other uh, BIM authoring tools should generate GBXML so that they can consume it. We are trying to avoid this manual cleaning process to a certain extent by uh, making sure that the original uh, GBXML export is meeting some standards so that we don't have to fix them or manually touch them. Some of the issues that we have often seen are um, in this example uh, when ceilings and um, walls uh, meet, often we end up seeing some gaps and that is due to trying to generate um, you know, the geometry with very varying rules between tools. So when GBXML exported of the same model, we don't get consistency across. Um, what we found from the first five test cases is that um, if people are able to generate GBXML for these test cases, <clears throat> they are fairly accurate and consistent. So it is very important that we uh, try and pr provide more set of um, test cases so that this um, accuracy and reliability can be improved across all of the tools. This project was started in May 2019, and it's uh, about a 20-month duration, and it's a follow-up to an earlier project, uh, 1460, 1468, that uh, ASHRAE undertook um, maybe a couple of years ago. What we have set out to do in this project is to identify candidate GBXML test cases and um, you know, develop the standard procedures to create the test cases and establish some validation methodology so that these test cases can be run through a validation software by software developers and make sure that they are um, complying with the expected um, output from or, or BAM energy models from those GBXML files. Um, for the first task, we interviewed a number of um, modelers um, and tried to identify where the pain points are. Similar to the poll um, Stephen did a, a bit earlier ago, we have about six energy modelers a few software developers, students, and BEM engineers contributing to, um, you know, identifying the pain points. Where we have um, currently, um, you know, found serious need for test cases is listed here. We identified about 17 of them from these interviews. Um, often exterior walls with multiple layers, raised floors and ceilings, approached floor and ceiling with thick walls. These are all typical scenarios where um, modelers have had difficulty importing uh, GBXML and creating um, energy model. So, you know, to give you an idea of how these things occur um, in, in a multi-layered wall, <clears throat> typical GBXML output sometimes has up to 10 or 11 layers in them and some of them are duplicates. So we want to avoid any of this happening in the GBXML exports. So the authoring tools can verify and make sure that there is not going to be um, redundancies that will cause um, energy models to fail. Uh, similar uh, things uh, occurred with um, raised floors or drop ceilings. They are creating a gap between the upper floor and the lower floor and Sometimes modelers have their own, when I say modelers, BIM modelers, have their own in-house rules to avoid any of these problems from happening. However, architects, when they create these models, they know or pay attention to it. So currently we are going through the cleaning process. But if these were identified properly during the export process, then I don't think um, we will have to deal with them. So. Um, let me go here. Uh, so the first set of interviews produced about 17 um, geometry cases. And what we are seeing is that people are currently using GBXML mainly for geometry only. 
nobody is uh, taking advantage of internal loads or HVAC equipment. I think uh, the system analysis uh, tool probably is the first one which is going to test the boundaries of the HVAC export and, and how the energy models um, you know, um, consume that. Now, at the moment, we, we did not find uh, any uh, BIM, soft, BIM software uh, that can import either the internal loads or um, HVAC. In, in some cases, tools that are consuming GBXML explicitly state that um, do not um, import or, or do not use the um, thermal properties of the envelope components even. They're currently using it strictly for geometry purposes. So what we have um, done so far is identify about 30 test cases and uh, we are working on um, creating documentation and you know steps to create those test cases. Once when these test cases are developed, we will be putting this into a validation tool so that um, software developers can follow the um, test case development steps, create the test cases, submit the test case to the validation tool and verify if it passes all of the rules for meeting the requirements of those test cases. Um, in addition to this um, uh, test case validation process, we are also working on a viewer selection. At the moment, we are considering um, the Autodesk um, 4G API, Ladybug Spider, and Bilsum Hub Viewer. Um, one of these will be integrated with the validation tool. So anyone who has um, a GBXML should be able to upload it to the validation um, uh, tool and view their GBXML and um, walk through their models. With that, I think I'm going to stop, um, Stephen. That gives a, a brief summary of the project and where we are at. All right. Thank you, Krishnan. Okay, so we actually have some time for question and answer. And so if you are interested in asking a question, and I'm not talking about the little applet, but, you know, via your voice, if you want to ask a question, why don't you do this? Why don't you raise your hand? There should be a, a button that allows you to raise your hand. And I will see you raise your hand, and I will then enable you to speak. And then one of our panelists will hopefully be able to answer your question. So anybody who has a question, please raise your hand and I will then uh, unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. So feel free to go ahead and raise your hand and I'll do that. So anybody. Hey, Stephen, can I ask a question to Ian? <laughs> well, Absolutely. Ready? Okay. Let's, let's get it started. Yeah. Hey, Ian. Um, I'm interested in knowing how is Revit um, system analysis accessed at the moment? Uh, yeah, just through Revit, Krishnan, what you need is uh, you'll need at least Revit 2020, and then when you get that, you need the update to it, which, you know, if you've installed Revit, should be automatic. If it's not, just go to any of your taskbar, you'll see a thing called Autodesk Application Manager, and get the dot one update, and then once you get that, it's just in Revit. So this is going to be a new icon on the um, the analyze tab. Yeah. The analyze tab. Okay, that's yeah. what I want. And, and just it's a little hidden, right? But the actual that little tree I was showing you with the analytical systems that's part of in Revit called the system browser. And unless you're using Revit in an MEP mode, you, that won't necessarily be open. So you need to go to your uh, view properties and enable the system browser, and then you'll see analytical systems there. Cool. If you, if you watch the recording from our thing yesterday, I did a live demo. I kind of fudged it a little bit. I messed up halfway through, but you'll see the basic workflow in there. Or if you just follow the help as well. Thank you. All right. Any questions at all? I don't. Okay, I do see a couple raised hands here. So um, here's one. I will enable uh, Jerome uh, Sabag. So Jerome, you should be able to speak now. 
Hi, great, thank you. Hi, my name is Jerome. I'm uh, an energy modeler based in Israel. I have a question for Ian. Uh, the, the new feature of the systems uh, modeling in Revit, does it include the standard systems such as uh, uh, those defined in ASHRAE? Um, uh, is, it, is it something that we create from scratch or are there some uh, default systems that we can use to run a preliminary model? Right. So, 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 hey, Jerome. So, so, first of all, there's no kind of like just template that contains all of that, if you know what I mean. But to create mm -hmm. the typical system types, if when, when you were looking at that little video going by that was showing you picking the air system, picking the zone equipment, all the classic stuff that you see in there, like VAV, VAV reheat, uh, electric or gas, um, you know, package rooftop units, you can you can create pretty much anything that you're used to creating. We haven't automated the creation of ASHRAE baselines yet. That's something that we're looking at because there are already measures for doing that. So we just need to connect that to the measures or you could do it for yourself. But in other words, to the example I was showing you there was a pretty, you know, basic system, but complex one in terms of it's a full VAV with chill water loop, uh, 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 um, cooling towers, things like that. So, you know, you, you, can, you can create all the stuff that you're kind of used to. It's, uh, it doesn't take very long to create them. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. All right, uh, let's go to Rob Ishkoff. Rob, you are live. Uh, thanks, Steve, Stephen. Um, I wondered if uh, any of these efforts would be posting example GBXML files that included HVAC elements so that um, we could be just looking at, at how those um, files are structured. Hey Rob, yeah, I mean, I did do, do provide a very quick screenshot. It probably went by really fast, and I did just show the section of the GBXML that was using those um, uh, one or two of the existing elements yep. plus new. Um, but yeah, again, if you run this, uh, the GBXML is created in the background. I mean, we try to make the workflow as you know, you all export import anywhere. If you know, you just want to run the analysis. So behind the scenes in a temporary folder, the GBXML is being created, the Open Studio measures are being run, uh, the Open Studio input file is being created, and you can grab all of that and see the GBXML there. Um, the, one of the reasons we've hidden a little bit is that we've actually hacked, G, we've added to GBXML, it's not legit GBXML, if you know what I mean, it was, these elements don't fully exist mm -hmm. in the way we've used them, and we, so we don't want to export it as GBXML until we reach that, until we reach that point, right? Um, but yeah, you can you can you can see what's in there. We love your feedback on the structure of it. It's something we've taken to a point. We believe it still needs a little bit more work, which is why we're talking to Stephen and the board about that. Um, but yeah, it's all it's all there. In other words, for you to see, that's the beauty of it. Okay, thank you. All right, next is Filippo. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, hi. And this is a question from uh, Jan. Um, actually, I wanted to ask. Uh, Maybe I, I missed something in the first part of the presentation, but the, the actual modeling of the file of the analytical model, uh, it, it is not anymore with uh, energy settings or room space boundaries, but uh, it is somehow made by also manual adjustment within Revit, and then we can export it uh, in GBXML. Uh, hey, Philippe, uh, uh, Philippe, that's sort of right and wrong. I mean, uh, it's not the only bit that you stated that it was kind of wrong is that it's it's not anymore, if you know what I mean. The existing ways that you've maybe done it before still exist. Um, okay. But, but but what I was kind of showing was there was, was yeah, I mean, you can, it all goes back to, fundamentally, you're not modeling an analytical model. You know, when you saw that blue and green thing, you're not actually physically modeling that. What you're doing is, you're either extracting elements that you want from the architectural model, like the mass or the shell or the walls or the floors, and then you could optionally add something to that, like you could add a mass or a shell or a some interior walls and things like that to give you the zoning that you want. And so, so does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and uh, another question, and do you think it would be possible to uh, to use a copy monitor tool to link this analytical model to the architectural model because uh, I, I saw in the question and answer section that the, at the moment they are kind of separated and they're not linked. Yeah, in fact, in the video that I showed there, I was actually using copy monitor uh, to, to, in that I was just using the levels 
Um, but you can bring other stuff over as well, you know, levels, grids, floors, walls. Um, uh, you can, if you want, even just copy entire elements from the architectural model into it. But, and, and, and in the last example, I showed it processing the entire model. Now, that might sound like the easy option, uh, which it can be. I mean, you can do that really, really fast. But the one price you pay for that is that the processing time is going to go up, right? As long as you're willing to you know, wait a little longer for the simulation to run, uh, then that's fine, right? But it's just something to be aware of. Um, so, so it allows us to sort of bridge, bridge the gap. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good. You're welcome. All right, another question from, um, I think it's Evgeny uh, Kurbato. You're live, Evgeny. Yeah, hi everyone. So um, here in our company, we have an established workflow where our designers uh, work in Revit. Uh, they prepare a 3D model. Let's say they generate uh, a GBXML model. And then after that, uh, actually a project manager just takes over uh, this uh, uh, model and continuous input like space types maybe it may be arranged by system and stuff like that so it looks like uh, the input is divided right so between modeling and uh, inputting uh, extra information maybe not every designer is aware about so uh, for me it looks like uh, a DBXML uh, should be able uh, to, or let's say, a tool which uh, is designed to review a GBXML file. It also should be able to allow us to make some inputs, right? So even, uh, let's say, arrange zones and uh, uh, arrange spaces, uh, assign space types and something like that. So is it something uh, developing in this way, like, uh, 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 should we expect a tool which uh, reviews a GPXML file and also allows some inputs? Um, right, there's a lot in that. I mean, just in terms of the workflow that you described, I mean, some people do something similar to what you described. There's different ways I could interpret it, and it's all about the degree to which you're modeling in Revit versus adding stuff after the fact. Um, I'm going to take a guess that this feature will work with what you're already doing, but the, the, the critical thing here is that you're, you know, again, remember the analytical model, the, ultimately the GBXML what gets fed into the thing is generated with one click, right? But it's generated from whatever is in the Revit model. So that could be just geometry, right? But even then there's going to be defaults around other things. But the point is you can, you, and this is especially where links become handy, right? Because the idea of everyone working in the one model is kind of a, you know, a red herring, if you know what I mean. In reality, you're probably going to work through a link or something like that. And once you're in a link, you could use walls in your model that have the thermal properties that you want in Revit. You could have spaces that have the thermal property that you want in Revit. So essentially, the data, Revit's data model is now essentially complete. Uh, you can add everything in, data, in Revit. You can link the architectural model in just as either just as a reference or pull pieces of it in, assign the thermal properties to things that you want, and then when you run analyze, all of that is in there. So um, that's that's the best I can kind of try and answer that. I really need to understand your workflow more precisely to, to give you more advice on your question. Sorry. Okay. okay. Great. So we are almost out of time. Are we Let me allow Michal to ask his question. And then we do have some outstanding questions. What we'll do is we'll, we will answer them and email to you because we have a record of all the people asking questions. So we will email you and let you know. So, um, Michal, I'm going to, going to enable your microphone. You should be able to ask your questions and try to make it short since we are pretty much out of time. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Great presentation and question uh, regarding the Revit. Did we expose uh, all the parameters for all the simulation in Revit, which means we can use automation later on to somehow fill them up and later on run all the uh, calculations? So I'm in interested if all these parameters are exposed and we are able through, I don't know, Dynamo or some other means to fill up the data and improve right. a bit of this workflow? Hey, Michael, it's good to hear from you. That's a great question. And I'm sorry, Stephen, I, just, I do want to take this one. Just let me go two minutes over if I can. Um, so, so actually, the answer to that is yes and no. Um, on the no side first, right, I think you guys know, right, that if we tried to add every parameter that 
not just energy plus needs, but it, it, we, we don't want to make it too specific to that either, right? That it would just bog rev it down. There's too many different ways to define equipment properties and things like that. So the only new parameters we've added to Revit are these things, zone equipment, air systems, and water loops. And they get matched to the analytical spaces so that you understand the basic topology, right? Everything else is being sort of derived by the measures. So like the, the chiller performance curves, the fan performance curves are all being defined in measures. Now, having said that, um, uh, with, for example, zone objects, uh, air systems, and water loops, you can add custom parameters uh, to Revit. And when you do that to those objects, they actually get included in the GBXML. So when you look at the GBXML, so you could add something completely arbitrary. And in fact, I didn't show it because it's a little bit detailed, but when you want to do a DOAS, all you need to do is add the parameter to Revit called DOAS, assign it to the air system, and then check that on, and the next time that thing will behave as a DOAS because we've written the script to pick that up. So, 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 in other words, we don't want to try to be the ones that determine what parameters need to be in Revit for systems analysis. We're trying to create the minimal footprint and sort of connective tissue between Revit and all analysis tools. Um, and you can obviously use Revit to add more parameters yourself as well. So, uh, it's a kind of a yes and no answer. So, okay. Yeah, Michal's muted. Yeah, oh, yeah, great. Thank you very much. It is uh, great stuff, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. All right, I know that we're over. We do have another question, so uh, if you want to make it short, Aaron, I'm going to enable your microphone, and this will be the last question. Like I said, any others, please email me, or we will try to answer any open questions in the applet here. So, Aaron, go ahead and ask a quick one. Aaron, are you available? Maybe not. Oh, his phone dropped. Okay, so he's not available. Aaron, if you want to ask your question uh, via the applet, you can do that. We'll try to get to it. All right, so it looks like there are no more questions. And like I said, feel free to email me if you have any further questions, and I'll try to forward them to the correct people. And I do want to thank everyone for attending. I think there's some great stuff out there, taking advantage of GBXML, and look out for more webinars in the future. So once again, thank you all for attending and have a great day. Thank you, Stephen.